Let me just share this with you quickly before we begin this hymn, uh, Blessed Assurance. And of course, this is one of the very old hymns that we, we sing a lot. A lot of times we, we don't even need the hymnal to sing things like this. But every once in a while we'll sing something and the, the, the words will just just hit me in a way that they that, you know may not any other time. I, I attended a, a luncheon yesterday. I was telling Nanette about it. This luncheon that uh, uh, that Women of Vision from Carson Newman had put on, and they they did it. You know, they, they do the decorating of the tables. And there's a theme, you know, with each table, and, and what it was was uh, uh, hymns. Each each table was decorated as a with a different hymn theme. And so as we were walking around looking at the tables, you know, some of them was really obvious. Uh, Carol uh, Strebel, who invited me, her table was uh, the old rugged cross. Of course, she had an, an old rugged cross on the table. Some of them were like, hmm, I wonder what that one is. Some of you were easy to figure out. One had a globe on it, and I said, this has got to be. He's got the whole world in his hands. No, it was, this is my father's world. That was a good one. Uh, Suzanne Sanders did one with, with little candles and lights all over it but for this little light of mine. But, you know, you, you think of these hymns uh, that, that just we know. What an encouragement that the words to these hymns are. This blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I mean, he's mine. And then, it, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And then you could add, I am an heir of salvation. I am a purchase of God. I am born of his spirit and I am washed in his blood. This is my story and I'm sticking to it. So... I, I love that hymn. So anyway, just throw that in. Uh, this week we are up to Joshua 20 and 21. I, I forgot to tell you last week to read both of those chapters. So uh, next week we'll just do uh, chapter 23. Each of the next weeks will just be single chapters. But these were, were both uh, fairly short chapters, but they go together as these these uh, places, these cities are designated in, in our study through Joshua last week, we studied the division of the land among the 12 tribes of Israel. And we were introduced to Caleb who, who could drive, I mean, who could fight as good as he ever did. And, and we also talked a little about just who the 12 tribes of Israel was. And in this historical context, in, in just uh, we're talking about physical places and physical people. This is simply the families of the 12 sons of, of Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. From Levi, one of those sons would come all the priests and, you guessed it, the Levites, those who would take care of the tabernacle and then later the temple. That, that was their job. That was, that was, uh, uh, you might say that was their lot in life. That was what they were designated to do. And Aaron was one of the Levites, and then all the sons of Aaron would be priests. All the firstborn sons would be the high priest. But but they, as, as you read, if you read this, you saw that they weren't given any property. They, they were given places to live, but they did not own physical property. Their portion or their lot in life was to, to come directly from God. They were to serve God. We noted last time that another of Israel's sons, in fact, one of his two favorite sons, I mean, talk about dysfunctional families, but that's another story. But one of his favorite sons, Joseph, you know, coat of many colors, sold into slavery. And then his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, would receive property and would take their place making up the 12 sons or tribes of Israel. This week in our study, we come to the allocation of what's known as the cities of refuge and the Levitical cities. Now, I, as I said, I forgot to tell you to read both these chapters together, but if you were reading it, you may have been drawn into the next chapter as, as the rest of the story. So, so what is a city of refuge? First of all, it's not a sanctuary city like we see in the news today. It's not uh, not even going to go down that road. But a city of refuge, as it's sown in Scripture, is also not a get-out-of-jail-free card. I've, I've often used that phrase that becoming a Christian does not come with a get-out-of-jail-free card or get-out-of-trouble-free card. 
And with that same idea, the city of refuge was not an ought to get out of jail free card. There still were consequences to pay. But what I want to look at this morning is, is the cities of refuge and the Levitical cities, both as what they were literally, physically, historically, as we read in Scripture, and what they are spiritually or symbolically, and, and what we can take from this for our own journeys. But let's begin with prayer. Father, as we continue studying this Scripture, as we continue taking this book of Joshua, as it comes, just historically, uh, uh, narratively, we take it as it comes to learn what was happening in the history of Israel. We need to know that. And we need to also know, Lord, what this means in our own lives. It's not just dead history. It's not just something that happened in the past. You had this recorded. You had this preserved in Scripture for us, for those who would read this in, in the latter times, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, for those of us upon whom the end of the age has come. These are important things for us to know. I pray, Father, that you will open our hearts and our minds to see in your words what it is you would have us to know, what you would have us draw from it for our daily lives, for the world we live in is not our home, but we are here for this time and this place. How would you have us serve you? What would you have us know? What would you have us do? May that be our, our reasoning for studying and knowing your word to serve you and to praise you and to walk closer in your way. We thank you for your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first of all, as I, as I always do, I want to look at it literally because this is real. This, this is just like reading their history. This is what happened. This is real. These were real cities. These were real cities in real time. As we, as we said last week, I think uh, people lived there. They were, they were born. They, they, they did all the things that babies do. They grew up. They, they fell in love. They got married. They lived. They died. Real, just as real as we were talking earlier about new babies being born and, and, and our relationships with these babies. They were just as excited over their babies as we are with ours. These are real. Matthew Henry in his commentary said that the cities of refuge were for when the land was, or excuse me, when the hand was guilty and not the heart. Now let that sink in for a minute. I love that phrase. I love that. It was a great way to put it. When the hand was guilty, but not the heart. One of God's very first orders of business after giving the Ten Commandments back in Exodus 20 was, in Exodus 21, was to give the promise of a provision when you get there, when you get to this promised land. Now, you know, we know now that it was going to be 40 years later. They didn't know that at that moment. It's going to be 40 years later. But when you get there, there will be a provision for a place of refuge when a life had been accidentally taken. One of the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt not kill. But the word kill there means to murder. We, we could say, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not intentionally, on purpose, take an innocent life. God knew, though, that there would be times of accidental taking of life. That, that can't be avoided in life. And that had to be addressed. So the details of these places, though, are first given in number 35 within the instructions for the cities for the Levites. The places of refuge are always connected to the cities of the Levites. Now, now what's up with that? The Israelites knew that there would be cities set aside for Levites. They wouldn't own the property. They, they didn't own lands. They didn't own flocks. But because of how how the Levites would work, this whole system of Levites would work, there, there were, uh, I think it's described in Chronicles as courses. I think there's like 24 courses of, of priests and Levites. And they would be on duty. I 
mean, if you've ever worked a swing shift or, or uh, you know, where your shifts change, there are times when you're on duty and times when you're off. Those who are, are police officers or particularly firefighters, I think, they're on so long and they're off so long. The Levites were the same way. They were all there at the temple all the time. Some were on duty. Some were at their home, so they had to have a place to live. So within the cities of the Levites, though, among these cities would be six places of refuge for, as the Bible calls it, the manslayer. That's where we get the word manslaughter. The manslayer. Someone who kills someone accidentally. In fact, when this place, this place set aside for refuge, the fact that it is spoken of in four different books of the Bible, four different books of the Old Testament, tells us how important it is. Anytime you see something repeated, that, t- that gives you a clue of how important it is. So it, it, we read about it in the book of Exodus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, and in here in Joshua, where it is actually carried out here. That gives us a clue to its importance. Even a brief look at Scripture teaches that God places great importance on the sanctity of life. I mean, there's a whole whole lot we could teach there that we, we don't have, have time to go into. But he, wish, he wishes to impress upon the Israelites and us as well that even the accidental taking of a life has to be dealt with. Whether it's on purpose or not, it has to be dealt with. But it has to be dealt with in the proper way. And so that's what these cities of refuge are for. Verses 1 through 6 of Joshua 20 gives us the command for the cities of refuge. And it's, it's, I've seen this, I'm beginning to see it play out more and more as the more I study scripture, this, this pattern of what God does. He will tell you how something's going to happen and then it happens. Or he tells you how you should do it and then you do it. We see that in the Passover. He tells them how to do the Passover, and then they have the Passover. Verses 1 through 6, how you're to have these cities of refuge. And then in verses uh, 7 through 9, the fulfillment of that command. So this is how it worked. In the ancient world, in, in, the, in biblical times, this, this period of time, blood revenge was widely practiced. The moment a person was killed, his nearest relative, we we see that term as kinsman redeemer, his nearest relative took responsibility for the vengeance. Well, this this vendetta thing was often handed down from generation to generation, much like we, we hear about feuds, uh, you know, in, in, in the early Americas here, the feuds that would go on. So that as it went on, increasingly larger numbers of people got involved. First of all, one person was killed, so his family took revenge. Well, when the family took revenge, and the other family, and it went on and on. So the need in ancient Israel, God says, this is not, it will not be this way among my people. There will be a method to deal with it. So what they did, uh, this uh, cities, these special cities that were provided, was provided to fill that need. In Joshua 20, verses 1 through 3, we get a distinction is made between premeditated murder and accidental manslaughter. So look at those. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Designate the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. That would took place back in Numbers. That the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally without premeditation may flee there and they shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. And so, so this, this was found in greater depth in the book of Numbers, the, the, the more detail of this. So they already knew that. And so this was all Joshua had to share. In, in, in the case of the nearest kinsman, the, uh, became the avenger of blood, they would kill the guilty party. But if a person accidentally killed another person, he was provided a place to go until it was all sorted out. One of these In one of these six cities of refuge, he, but he had to go there immediately. That, that was the thing. When, when it happened, uh, if someone was killed accidentally, 
you weren't to go home and get your thing. You were to go to the city immediately so that your life would be spared, so it could be worked out. According to Jewish tradition, the roads leading to these cities were kept in, in better condition than any of the other roads. They were kept in excellent condition, and the, the roads were well marked with signage to get to, so a person would not have a question, where is this place I'm to go? It was well marked out, and uh, I, I even read one place where there were runners available to go with someone and show them the way to get there quickly. So Joshua then, in, in verses 4 through 6, when they arrived there at this city, uh, this place of refuge, the manslayer was to present his case, and, and I always imagine, breathlessly, I imagine, getting it out as quickly as possible, and he would share it with the elders of the city. Now, he didn't just run up to the gate and you know shout it in through the gate. That might be what comes to your mind. He had, go to the gate. Now, we know the city gates was where they conducted business. When it says go to the city gates, that just means go, go to the courthouse. Go to the place where they conduct business and share what had happened. First of all, what they would do is a, a provisional or a temporary decision would be made. Uh, something would be determined quickly with the surface facts. Get him a place to say, yes, this was accidental. We need to dig into this a little more, but it seems to be that way. Get him a place to stay. Grant him asylum until a trial could be presented in the presence of the assembly. Then, at that moment, if he was acquitted of premeditated murder, if it, if it was truly accidental, it, it was just, it, it's clear to all that that's what it was, then he would be acquitted of this and he could go on with life. But, there were still consequences to face. Look at verse 6 of chapter 20. And he shall dwell in that city. That's the city of refuge. He shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of the one who is the high priest in those days. Then the manslayer shall return to his own city, to his own house, and to the city from which he fled. Now that, that, that intrigued me. It, they all agreed that it was accidental. But somebody lost their life. You, you can't just go on with life as normal. Your life is changed. He was returned to the city of refuge where he would live until the high priest died. Now, what's that got to do with it? Why, why is the high priest died? Why, why can he not go back until then? Well, I, I did some research on that. And, and even if it proved that the death was accidental, he was not free to go. He had to stay there. So some commentaries that I looked at pointed back to Numbers 35, which stated that he must stay in the city of refuge until the high priest who was anointed with the sacred oil died. That represented a type of deliverance. This, you might say, a statute of limitations ran out. He could go back after that. Another thing that I read said that with the changing of the high priest, it would, like I said, represent that statute of limitations. But with that, I think it begins to take on a, a spiritual connotation. There's, there's something about that. A lot of times we'll read something like that in Scripture, and although there may be uh, uh, definitions or explanations given for it, it just sort of, I don't know, I don't know it sort of appeases what it is we're questioning. In other words, yeah, that answers it, but not fully. When I find something like that, that that doesn't quite, it doesn't quite explain it all, I think there's got to be a spiritual answer here. There's got to be a reason God put this in. It's got to represent something else. A lot of the things we read in the Old Testament that just seems strange is because it represents something else. It is a picture. Of, it's that word typology. It is a picture of something else. So what's going on here? That's, that's what I really wanted to know. The fact that he was returned to the city of refuge 
basically to live out the rest of his life, really struck a note with me. One, and he, here's what it says to us. Once a life is taken, nothing remains the same. You, you can't go back. E even if it's accidental, life is changed for everyone. We'll, we'll talk about more of that in just a minute. We must understand that the cities of refuge carried with them a spiritual meaning. Yes, they were real cities. Yes, they were physical places. Yes, they were places to go to. But they were a picture of something else as well. They were six city. These six cities were strategically located. They were easy access from either part of the Jordan River. There were three on the on the uh, eastern side of the Jordan River and three on the western side of the Jordan River. They were. Uh, so I, I think they were within one day's travel from any place in Israel. No matter where you were in Israel, a city of refuge was within one day's travel for you. Plus, here's something else that's important. These cities were not just for the Jews. They were, for as Numbers tells us, the alien and the sojourner. In other words, they were from for those others living among the Jews. Uh, the alien, that's someone who's a different nationality. The sojourner, we would call those refugees. They were available for them as well. In other words, these, these cities of refuge are for the foreigner who is visiting in your country as well as for the non-Jewish person who is living in your country. Paul would put that in Romans 1 for the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But, but it's important to note that these cities were appointed by God. It wasn't Joshua said, well, now, let's make this one and this. No, God told him which cities were to be the places of refuge. And now get this. Each name of each one of these cities carried a spiritual importance. Kadesh means sanctuary or redemption. Shekim means Shoulder, or we read in Isaiah 9, the government will be upon his shoulder. Hebron means communion. On the eastern side of the Jordan River, Bezer means a fortress. Ramoth means the high places. Golan comes from a word which means their captivity becomes their place of rejoicing. Each one of these words not only carried a meaning in its name, but each one of these words represent Christ. Give me chills, just like it. Each one of these names represents Christ. He is our place of refuge. Not, not one of these, none of these places were chosen by accident. You know, I, I, we were, I can't forget who I was talking to the other day, but we were talking about how little we really know about Scripture. And I was telling them, I said, yeah, I once tried to come up with, with a, an illustration for how little we know about Scripture. I don't care how many years you've spent studying. And, and finally, I hit upon it. If, you, if you've ever bought a, uh, a, a, a new uh, uh, appliance, or a piece of electronic equipment. You know that, that piece of plastic that they have over it, that little, kind of usually bluish in color, and you have to peel that off? That's about how much we know about Scripture. I mean, man, when we get to heaven, it, it's going to be so cool. But, but Okay, that, that's how little we know, this little bit. But not only were these cities places of refuge, these cities were located also in Levit they, they were Levitical cities. This, this is important. All the cities of refuge were Levitical cities. Not all Levitical cities were places of refuge, but these refuge, these six cities were Levitical cities. Now what's the point with that? Why, why, why was that? And I think it's so that the word of God, the Levites lived there, the priests lived there, someone lived there that could meet their needs spiritually, which is what they would really need. The Levites, as we said earlier, weren't given actual land or inheritance because God was their inheritance. But God did place them strategically throughout the land of Israel. There were 48 Levitical cities. And so every Levitical city was within 10 miles of another one. And when I read that, I thought, that reminds me of this, this phrase that we a lot of times use, a church on every corner. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, in my opinion, it's a good thing. 
There are places available for people. I mean, we, we read a lot. We, we live in an area or in a time, an era of mega churches and, and something for every age group, but a place of refuge. The word sanctuary means a place of refuge. But I think there's just, there's just something about a small church that allows its members to reach so deeply into one another's lives like we share every Sunday morning with our time of prayer. We share our praises, we share our prayers, we share our concerns, we share with one another. But, but now, think about this. We are all in cities of refuge to some extent. We may not have killed anyone, even accidentally. But we've all done things that have altered our lives for the rest of our lives. Even in the living out of life, things happen that change life forever as we know it. When, when Joe's dad died, uh, I, I was teaching through this for the first time and, and, and I just really saw that Joe, when, when Bob died, it, it was in many ways a lot different than losing my parents or even Joe's mother because he was the, he was the last parent to die. And if, you, if you've lost all your parents, you know that, that there's this feeling of, of orphan. You feel like an orphan because now you're, you're almost like you're, you're all alone in the world. And, and so those, those few weeks after, after he passed was like, like entering that city of refuge. And when you come to a city of refuge, your life is in turmoil and, and you're seeking, you're seeking a place of refuge, a place of, of peace and quiet. But for this one entering this city of refuge, once, once the outcome was determined in their lives, they still couldn't go back to what they used to call that normal. Well, we hear that phrase so many times now, but they entered a new normal, a new way of living. So, so here's what we know. Christ is our city of refuge. Our way to him has been prepared. It has been well marked out. There have been runners that have gone before us and directed our way to him. Our sin, your and my, our sin makes us guilty of his death on the cross. But look what he said. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That made us manslayers instead of murderers. We didn't know what we were doing, he said. And so it was in ignorance. And so there was forgiveness. We will live in our city of refuge until our great high priest, who is Jesus, takes us to our new home. Is living in this city easy? No. No, it's, it's not always. Do we have a right to ask for mercy? No, because we're guilty of our sin. But he tells us to. Many times I've cried out, God, I have no right to ask you this. I have no right, but you told me to. You told me to ask. You told me to ask, and I, I, you told me to seek, and I would find. You told me to ask, and it would be given. You told me to knock, and it, the door would be open, and so I'm asking. And that's how I bring my prayers sometimes. Being a Christian doesn't come with a get-out-of-trouble-free card. But it does come with a rock. And it does come with a place of refuge. So what can we take from this? Does feeling faithless and weak disqualify us from service? Well, I certainly hope not. Because I feel that way a lot. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12.10, When I am weak, then I am strong. Because it's at times when we are at our weakest, when we realize it's not our strength that's carrying us. There have been times when, when I have held so tightly to this scripture, I, 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 I've held on to it like, like somebody holds on to a life raft in the middle of the lake. Because I can't swim, so I hold on really tight. And sometimes this is all that kept me afloat. 
these the, knowing this and holding on to this and prayers and emails and texts and encouraging words from the others who are also in that city of refuge with me. As we've said, the city of refuge were within the Levitical cities. What better place for us to come to for refuge than from than among other believers? I am thankful for the city of refuge. I am thankful for the ultimate refuge, Jesus Christ. But I'm also thankful for this earthly place of refuge, this sanctuary that he allows us to come together and draw strength from, from other believers, just like they would have drawn from the Levites. I am thankful for our places of refuge. I am thankful that our places of refuge are found within places that teach us the word of God. And I am also thankful for, the, for you all, for my fellow residents who live in this city with me. So what's our task? What, what task are we given now? We need to do everything we can to tell others about this place of refuge and about the man of refuge, whether it's this place of refuge or other places, other cities' places of refuge where he dwells, the man of refuge, that is our responsibility. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this place of refuge. We, we thank you, first of all, that this story is given to us, that uh, we, we see it.